What do you think? Yeah, we're ready. Good afternoon. I'll call to order this meeting of the Health, Environment, and Community Engagement Committee. Uh, my name is Cam Gordon. I'm chair of the committee, and today I'm joined by Council Members Andrew Johnson, Alon Dracano, Jacob Fry, and Lisa Bender. Elizabeth Gooden will be joining us today. I think she's at the uh, State Capitol. Uh, we have a rather full agenda. We have three very interesting discussion items that I'm looking forward to. And, but prior to that, we'll cover our five consent items. And if any committee members want to pull something off for discussion, uh, we can do that with these. But I'll go through them, and my plan is to move all five of them as a slate. First one is accepting a grant from the Minnesota Department of Human Services um, for uh, $2,400 to conduct educational tobacco compliance checks and retailers. Second item is acceptance of another grant from the Minnesota Department of Health for lead poisoning intervention. That's a grant of $13,300. The third item is authorizing contracts with Pillsbury United Communities and Goodwill Industries, doing business as Goodwill Easter Seals, Minnesota, to provide support and education services for parents of youth at risk for violence in the amount of $37,500 for each contract. Fourth item is approving a city council uh, appointment of Joseph Des Enclos. I might be mispronouncing that. Sorry if you're here, Joseph. Uh, that's for seat 19, a member at large for a two-year term on the Public Health Advisory Committee. And the fifth item is to set a public hearing for May 2nd, 2016 to consider the subject matter of an ordinance amending Title III, Chapter 59 of the Minneapolis Code of Ordinances relating to air pollution and environmental protection, specifically about construction activities and amending provisions related to after-hours work permits. Any committee members wish to discuss any of those items or have any questions? Seeing none, then I'll move all of those items forward for approval. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, <laughs> say no. Those motions carry. And now we're ready to move on to um, item number six on our agenda. And this is from our health department. And I believe we're going to hear from Ms. Walker. And um, this is about our participatory youth-led research project on young male sexual health. Welcome and good afternoon. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. Um, I'll go ahead and introduce myself, and then as we go through the presentation, we'll have individuals uh, introduce themselves as well. Um, we're here to discuss the Young Male Sexual Health in Minneapolis, a youth-led participatory research project. Um, this was a project in partnership with Youth Prize Organization, um, 12 youth research consultants, and the Minneapolis Health Department, both the Youth Development and Adolescent Health Division, as well as the Research Division. Um, so if you want to refer to your PowerPoint as well, um, we just wanted to start off this uh, discussion to just remember and recognize the, vis the vision of the Minneapolis Health Department as it aligns with the goals of the city as well, um, looking at uh, healthy lives, health equity, and healthy environments as the foundation of a vibrant Minneapolis now and into the future. So as we think of the future, uh, we definitely want to recognize the young people in our community and the kind of uh, lived expertise that they bring to situations involving their health and the environment. Um, the reason this project uh, was actually implemented was we decided in 2014 to do a uh, adolescent health data analysis and programmatic investment review of what we're doing around adolescent sexual health in the city. Um, I do have a slide after this that discusses specific investments that we do currently have. Um, it was really important for us to, number one, ensure that the programs, policies, and practices that we're integrating into our work actually meet the needs of young people in the city. Um, and so after a review of the data, we decided that we wanted to look specifically at young male sexual health between the ages of 15 and 24, just based on some of the dis disparities that existed, primarily in the African American, American Indian, and Latino communities. And so um, as a part of this process, um, we decided to do program design that involved um, what we were calling, as you know, YPAR, the Youth Participatory Action Research. And so it's actually young people asking the questions about what's important, and then um, leading all of the um, 
implementation of the research design and then the program uh, and then the analysis. And so this is a, pro a project that we conducted in 2015. Um, we took all that information over the fall and analyzed it for themes. And then we created a report and recommendations that we wanted to communicate out to stakeholders, including decision makers here in the city of Minneapolis, as well as young people throughout the community. Just real quick, we did wanna highlight the current investments that we do have. Um, as you know, that we have the school-based clinics, which are in seven high schools across the city. Um, we do know that 36% of the clients are male, but that doesn't necessarily reflect those that are actually getting family planning, health education, and STI screening services. Um, we do um, assist Minneapolis Public Schools in implementing Making Proud Choices, which is a science-based sex education curriculum in the middle school grades. I know last year we had about 2,400 youth um, in those grades receive sex education. Uh, we also support some culturally specific curriculum and peer education, which includes currently a program with Planned Parenthood of Minnesota to implement peer education at Wellstone International High School with African immigrants. And prior to that, supported a, a culturally specific sex ed curriculum for American Indian youth with the vision of Indian work. Um, we also currently have investments in Seen on the Streets, which is focused on um, health education and outreach, as well as STI screenings for uh, primarily men 15 to 20 but they also serve um, older older men. We also have the Crush Collaborative, which is um, a, a collaborative that's focused on the north side. Um, young people came up with the name Community Restoring Urban Youth Sexual Health. And so they have a teen council that does a lot of outreach as well as uh, we piloted a barbership project, a barbershop project last year, um, as well as a statewide STI testing day. Something real quick that I do wanna know is that aside from school-based clinics, we don't have any general fund money um, that is investing in these programs. It's really supported by uh, TANF funding, which is federal funding, and then local public health dollars. Thank you. Thank Chair you. Gordon, members of the committee, my name is Megan Keynes. I'm an epidemiologist with the health department. The gonorrhea rate per 1,000 youth in Minneapolis is fairly stable despite some volatility from year to year. It actually hasn't ended in a place particularly different than it started about 10 years ago. There are currently, in 2014, we tracked 233 cases among youth 15 to 19 year olds and 390 cases among young adults 20 to 24 years old. As you can see, we are slightly different. We are greater than the Minnesota numbers, but we are also generally more stable in terms of where we begin and where we end. You might have read in the newspaper in the last few days that the 2015 numbers that the Minnesota Department of Health have released uh, show a concerning trend increasing our numbers of gonorrhea and chlamydia among this age group. Our chlamydia rate is higher, but again, despite year-to-year -year volatility, is generally ending in the same place it began. Um, our numbers are trending upwards among 20 to 24 year olds, which is of concern because it's harder to find a single place to locate this population as opposed to 15 to 19 year olds where we can generally expect to find them in school or other programs uh, targeted at people of their age group. The thing that is of the most concern to us, however, is that if you look at the top pie chart, this shows us the distribution of youth who reside in Minneapolis. About half identify as white only, and the other half identify as a variety of backgrounds. Our chlamydia and gonorrhea infections, however, are not distributed in this way among the population. Mostly, it is individuals who identify as black or African American who have these diagnoses, and that's of great concern to us. So um, before we actually get into the fun part of the presentation um, about the research that the young folks did, um, we did want to again highlight the determinants of population health and why it's so important for us to take a holistic approach to this. Um, as you know, um, I think a lot of times historically people like to view health behaviors as the single uh, most important factor that contributes to population health. However, if you look at the pie chart, we know that about half of it is healthcare and health behavior. So that's including access to healthcare, it's really important to look at the physical environment and then socioeconomic factors that contribute to um, health outcomes, including education, employment, income, family and social support, and community safety. And it's really important when we think about the equity work that does happen across the city. We know that uh, 
there are specific geographic and cultural communities that bear the burden of the disparities. And so we just wanted to highlight that as we move forward. Okay, Chair Board and members of the committee. Welcome. Um, just wanted to talk very briefly about the process of, of this project, which started when um, Olivia and Meg came to me at, and Jorge Rivas at Youth Prize to engage in a participatory process in which young people would be. Why don't you introduce yourself too? Okay, cool. That's me. Okay, I'm David Kim. Uh, I was a member of Youth Prize and then, you know, um, continued on the project um, as a contractor. But um, Basically, the work that we did at Youth Prize was engaging young people in research in a more participatory way so that young people would be a part of the research design and then also the analysis and the conclusions, which is why we connected on this project. So um, this is just a, uh, an overall understanding of, of who was involved in the project from the Minneapolis Department of Health or the Minneapolis Health Department side and then the team of four of us at Youth Prize. Um, and then we had we started with 15 youth research consultants who were there to guide the project from its from its beginning point with the goals that had been established through the process of design and then um, data collection and analysis. And then we had a wide variety of partner organizations um, serving you know young people on the north and south side of Minneapolis um, and a wide variety of um, racial groups. Okay. So we wanted to begin the process basically by including the 15 young, uh, young people in the design of the process, and, but we wanted to begin with kind of undoing some of the understandings of research that most people come to, uh, the assumptions that we come with to the process that, you know, it usually includes one researcher from a university coming to a group of people in the so-called community, and then, you know, a story extraction follows, and then there's not much recipro reciprocity. So we, we recruited 15 young people from, you know, and the, the focus of the, the project was black, Latino, and native young people, young men, and, um, and that was the kind of who composed our, our group of, of youth research consultants. So we went through a, a four-week training of an understanding of research and the possibility of a framework of research that was more based in research justice and participation, and, um, and then through public health, understanding of, of sexual disease in research and into um, the design of the research project. So it was a dynamic process that we shaped over the course of the, the first few months, going back and forth on questions and design and, um, and then into data collection. Okay. And then together we, we had kind of, we had our, our very traditional interview and focus group side and then we had a photo voice side that began that was called the Minneapolis String Challenge that added a different layer of of data collection for um, for our project. You want to talk about that, Tyson? Okay. Um, good Hi. afternoon. My name is Tyson Trueblood. I was one of the fifteen researchers. Um, we to get our data, we did focus groups. Um, one of the focus groups we did, we went to a park over in North Minneapolis called Farview. Um, they had a run and shoot basketball league, which was predominantly African American men between the ages of 14 to 21 playing basketball on teams. Um, we pulled the teams aside. We went team by team. There was like five different teams. We went team by team and um, split the teams up into two and did focus groups with the two with, or with the different teams. And we also did a, a photo voice project called the Strength Challenge where we ask people to take a picture of something in the community that gives them strength or gives them hope or belief in the community. And um, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we had, we wanted to get a strength-based side of the, the project in order to understand where young people were finding strength and gathering in places that, you know, in, in addition for future study that we could we could go to in order to understand the possibilities for solutions. Okay, so we went through a typical um, analysis and interpretation process and then we played back um, some of these themes with the, the group of young people that we were working with. Um, and these are the themes. No, I'm doing the theme, right? Cool. And Nisi will help go through the themes. 
Um, I believe is chair and members of the committee, right? That's a good way to say okay, it. Cool. <laughs> Score one. All right. So basically the themes is what we use to go through the interviews and do a lot of codings and find um, basically the common themes. So like what was the root of it all? Um, a lot of them we found was experience with sex education. Um, in schools, there was not a lot. Um, let me back up a little bit. So there was a large population of queer young males as well who had um, a lot of these diseases. And we found out in schools that they don't teach about uh, sexual health amongst the LGBTQ community. So that was one, for example, um, the influence of media, of course, uh, they don't talk a lot about condoms, they don't talk a lot about sex, it's very taboo. So there was not a lot of correct information coming from the media. The information that was coming was very general, societal, very constructed by certain things. Uh, the decision-making paradigms, uh, race, gender, heteronormativity, goes back to that um, sexual education, um, understandings of sexual health and evaluation of sexual health, so everything that it means. Um, a lot of times we found out in schools that they kind of give a rundown of, okay, these are the STIs, these how you know you got it, and um, pretty much avoid sex was a lot of that came out of sexual health and understanding that and evaluating that and what it means. There was nothing about uh, the social, emotional context of it all. So there was a disconnection with that. Um, spaces of interaction, strength and support. So that kind of came out of the research and it was kind of addressed with the photo voice of like the strength and all. Um, but there was not um, the spaces that they were able to go to uh, it wasn't really clear for like what was available for them in terms of like support with sexual health, strength in sexual health, and interactions with sex. Sorry, I'm saying sex a lot, but. Um, and then participant solutions. So actually solutions that came from the participants and what the participants can do to help solve things, right? And I'll just, I'll highlight a few things from the from the data collection that kind of strengthen these themes that young people were really critical of the media and kind of understood the media as a basically a teacher of sex ed they, they were able to very clearly identify that but then they also were able to be very critical about the kind of emptiness of it as like a sufficient teacher of of sex and healthy sexuality and all of the holistic pieces of of sexual engagement that they understand but they saw the emptiness of media and did not actually find many supports to strengthen their critique of the media and like alternatives for their own education, which, you know, primarily came through brothers, family members, which were, you know, they, they saw as, you know, that was their primary mode of, of getting sex ed outside of the classroom, but then they also found that as a bit insufficient and primarily fear-based in, in the ways that those were transmitted. But also it was like a source of strength, the family. But I think like young people are really brilliant in their crit critique of media, but then there's this kind of understanding that there's a need for something more. The other thing was related to race, young people, and these were all young men of color who we interviewed, is just a real deep understanding of race and racial trauma as something that shapes, you know, the, all of the ways that um, young men of color engage with sexual education and sexual health as like a very like deep context that was explicitly identified even when we wouldn't ask questions related to, um, you know, to race and racial trauma, young people would kind of, it would just emerge spontaneously. And we found that happen in interview after interview, this would happen as kind of this mistrust with the medical system, perhaps without even articulating like a specific instance of, you know, um, you know, I guess research abuse in the past with related to medical, medical research, but really a conscious awareness and that was like kind of voiced as a big barrier to you know sexual health and sexual uh health programming working well so that was just a very like interesting thing to come up and i think in our solutions it's kind of really important that that be a center point in in the work that um can come out of it is young people and young people of color in particular being able to really engage in a mutual process that is aware and and kind of viscerally understands the context of race and racial trauma. Okay, so um, for our primary recommendations, we would say that, um, again, with the young people, the young men of color who are 
uh, at the center of this this study that they would be communicated with and engaged primarily in programming going forward, and particularly in the in the creation of solutions. Um, and then you know to be able to engage the city and public health uh, to collaborate. And you know really one of the things we found in this project is that it's really it's essential that young people be involved. In, as researchers to engage other young people in the process that actually maybe there needs to be kind of a public health young people as researchers and then young people as participants in kind of the design of these these kind of interventions okay and of course investments that's self-explanatory i feel um <laughs> and really and the the big thing that i think came up with with the solutions piece of the, the project was that young men wanted these things to be invested in in a very accessible way, and that meant like geographically accessible in places and spaces that made sense to them, like on the streets, in the corner store, in spaces that they go to regularly rather than isolated in kind of clinics that carry certain taboos or you know, certain people go to those kind of clinics or um, things that, you know, they carry a kind of emotional weight and you know, there was over and over was like, why don't we have this um, in our own spaces already? And then also like a very explicit, like, why don't we have our own people doing this who have support to teach this? Like I could teach this was said over and over young people, like I would want to lead a black men's sexual empowerment group, things like that that came up that I feel are really powerful in terms of the content that's available to be leveraged and used, but may not be currently invested in. So would that be like, uh, could I just ask a question about this um, health services in the neighborhood or whatever, would that be like a drop-in center? Uh, and you said convenience store, but I don't know whether we could have that in a convenience store. Is there any uh, anything more concrete about, I'm just trying to visualize what the hope was. Obviously they're saying the school-based clinic isn't enough, they don't necessarily want to go into North Point or something, but, mm -hmm. but somewhere separate. Yeah, when we think, oh. Chair and members of the committee, when we think about places that young people get the information, again and again we heard it's older brothers, older cousins, older friends, peers, and family members. And so how do we make accurate um, science-based education available for families? Um, one solution that came up was uh, how we train community health workers in different communities. So if they're doing street-based outreach, they could be in the barber shop. They could be on the corner store. Um, we did have a pilot project um, that was based on a barbershop project uh, by Laura Jamont, who's a, a premier adolescent sexual health worker um, who works on culturally specific practices and programs. So we did a pilot with North Point last year to incentivize conversations with barbers. And then if, um, if young people or men actually made the next step to go to the clinic, then there was an incentive that would be given to the barbershop um, owners. So trying to think of new and innovative ways uh, beyond just programs and clinical services. Um, a couple of other ideas that came up were having block leaders with condoms accessible, having little lending libraries, and really thinking about other places that young people can access education. So another idea that came up was doing community gardens and integrating um, holistic health, including sex, sex education and not just um, nutrition. I have so, another question maybe before we move on. Thank you, Mr. Ahead. Chair. Just so we could understand better what the status quo is today, mm -hmm. I, I'm not familiar with how our schools handle sexual education and I mm -hmm. wondered if someone could get a, give a brief summary of even mm -hmm. if it's, you know, what grade it starts in, is it, does every school have yep. sex ed? Yeah. So, and that's something that we are gonna get to when we get to the recommendations. Uh, but as of now, there are no Minnesota state standards for sexual health. So it's really hit or miss in terms of what's even available in different communities. So we know that there's a lot of rural communities that have no access to sex education. Um, we know here in the, in the Metro County, both our health department as well as the county um, are really doing a lot of work around providing those services to health education. Um, I did mention that we do help implement uh, making proud choices in the middle school grades, but there's nothing K-5, even though there are national standards available for sex education, K through 12. And so again, it's really hit or miss. Um, we have done a previous assessment on charter school implementation, charter and alternative school. And that's also, I mean, I think out of the, at the time, it was about four years ago, only nine of the 22 middle school charter schools were implementing in any sort of health education. And a lot of that has to go to what kind of investments are available 
in Minneapolis public schools, just up until recently, there was two quarters of health education. They finally moved one to the middle school because they're realizing um, when you look at like the um, early sex initiation and the outcomes that are associated with that, it's just really important for our young people to get accurate information on the front end. And, and young people really had a lot to say around standards. Like the, mm -hmm. the people we interviewed had a lot to say, we need this, we need this, we need to understand how to communicate about sex, we need to have the emotional and you know relational piece of this education in our classes. And then they would, they, there were some people who had a group that they would go to or they travel across the city for mm -hmm. in order to access a group that was either cultural specific or just had a great teacher that they loved, but they would be at that class either after school or you know across the city in a different area, like specifically for that education. And it was related to kind of holistic ways of understanding more than just understanding this biology of how someone could get pregnant or get infected. And it was, you know, there was a, a lot of energy around, you know, things that young people think should be in it. And then again, you know, I'll teach this advanced sexual education course uh, as an offering, you know, from, from a few young people. So just so I can understand yeah, for sure what you said, there is no sexual health education in elementary schools in Minneapolis, and there is approximately like a quarter in each of middle school and high school that includes sexual health? That's, yeah, that's correct, right? Yeah, okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so um, I did include an attachment for all the council members as well in terms of specific recommendations. And so um, even though we kind of highlighted kind of like the three bulk, I just want to say again, um, they. Young people did say that they wanted to develop a common set of principles and policies for sex education in schools. Um, they want to learn from people that reflect their gender and racial background. And so when we look at kind of like the equity conversation, that's really about school districts continuing to push equity and recruitment and hiring practices in terms of who's actually implementing it and who, who young people look to as an authentic voice. I mean, young people are really smart. They can tell when someone's uncomfortable um, talking about a specific um, subject as well as whether they actually have accurate information. Um, uh, I know that David had mentioned it previously, but again, making connections to the holistic health and wellness, not just about biology or prevention information, and really thinking about the full spectrum of um, gender, sex, sexual identity, and um, sexual acts that young people are engaging in to make sure that they, again, have the accurate information for prevention. Um, we also, um, young people were interested in an investment in more research measuring risky behavior, and we took it a step further and said that um, we want to ensure that we're also connecting this information to the structural barriers that exist in different culturally specific and geographic communities. Um, and they were really interested in like the, la the launch of public health campaigns and our condom campaigns um, that again talk about comprehensive safety beyond pregnancy prevention, as well as being accessible to young people in spaces such as malls, libraries, athletic associations, and community organizations. Excuse me. So. Once again, this is like one is, is an example of one of the um, response to the strength challenge um, from the photo, photo voice. There it goes, Tyson. Hey, strength. Um, but this was just one video, one picture out of multiples. Uh, you can go on Facebook and I think you can have put the hashtag up and see more. What is it hashtag strength challenge for strength from MPLS? Hashtag strength for MPLS. Um, so there's some more on there. Uh, and we also did some spoken word pieces that will help um, bring some of that social, emotional consciousness to the whole matter. So if you guys want me to read some, then that'll be cool. Yes, I can please. read some. Um, heads up, these are not all mine. I think one of these are mine, but I'm gonna put it together because it sounds cooler. Okay. Touch will teach fighters how to become lovers. Touch will teach the weak how to become strong. Touch will teach the broken how to become whole again. Touch will teach the caterpillar how to become the butterfly. Touch makes comfortability out of connecting. Touch will teach boys and girls how to become men and women, to come to live, to come to live together like the wind, makes love to the ocean and watch the sea, the sunrise from the body of the sea. How do you prosper to be? Do you have a disease? Are you vocal? Do you have protection? Do you have sex often? Is this okay? Touch will teach my blisters how to become one again. 
to breathe, to fight what they've taught to be real. Touch makes love out of false thoughts. Touch brings life to holes and thoughts. Touch can touch the skin, which touches organs and touches energy, which touches the soul. It's a lot of touching in there, but <laughs> it was used as a prompt to help um, people who don't usually write spoken word to be able to express easier. So we kind of like set up these, like, you know, you guys, what is it called? Where you plug the words in to something, Mad Libs, thank you. <laughs> It was kind of like a shortened Mad Lib to where you can get creative. So that's what came out of it. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you for sharing. Councilmember Connell has a question. I'm not sure who it's for, or maybe a comment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, it's more of a comment. I just wanted to say thank you so much for coming to present on this issue. This has been one of the best presentations that I have seen in my full three years. Well, my third full year will be at the end of this year, so two and a fourth um, on the council. Uh, I really appreciate the um, community-based approach and solutions that have been presented here in the very nuanced, uh, youth culturally nuanced um, um, issues and ideas that have been presented here. And I really appreciate that so I can tell that this has been really awesome and amazing work that you all have done. I do wonder, if this issue of um, the sex ed work that we were just discussing here, as Councilmember Lisa Bender was asking some questions, is something that we can add to our agenda, our um, intergovernmental relations agenda, so that we can bring up this discussion at the state and wonder what other allies are also already working on this and if it's um, something that other folks are already working on at the state capitol and if we can just join their efforts. So I just wanted to say thank you for your hard work and your um, time and attention to this issue. Thank you so much. Councilmember Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I do have a question on school-based clinics and also great presentation, very informative, I think shocking about the lack of sex ed in our schools. And uh, obviously I think a lot needs to be done there. I appreciate the other ideas as well coming forward on this. Um, on school clinics, which schools do not have school clinics? I know there are some, I believe maybe two. Um, oh, oh. All the high schools have school-based clinics. Um, the one at North High is run by North Point. Okay. Um, other than that, we have them at all the other high schools and then also Broadway at Longfellow. And does Wellstone at this point? Um, when Wellstone was located at Roosevelt, yes, they had access. They don't currently have access, and I know that our director, Cordoner, has been working on um, how to triage potential services for the Wellstone location. Thank you. Currently, they do not. Well, Why don't you come up and... Tell us the status of Wellstone then. Thank you, Ms. Garner. Good afternoon, Coral Garner with the Minneapolis Health Department, uh, Council Chair and members of the committee. Wellstone uh, currently does not have access, at least through the Minneapolis Health Department to clinical services. Sure, I'd uh, personally love to see uh, providing service for Wellstone. I know I've talked with a school board member about this as well and they have a strong interest. So if there's something that uh, our department can do to bring forward a proposal so I, I saw you uh, say money or suggest money. Uh, certainly I'd be supportive of that. I'm guessing uh, others would be as well to make sure that we don't have gaps in our coverage. And if there's any other spots as well, since this school board member told me about Wellstone, that's why it was on my radar. But if we have any other gaps as well uh, that need to be filled, I'd love to uh, assist with that. So please don't hesitate to reach out to my office or uh, to bring something through this committee. I'd love to see a proposal for that uh, sooner than later. Thank you. thank you. Councilmember Fryer, did you also have a question? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. First off, outstanding work. Um, you're addressing some extremely important issues and your efforts are really appreciated. Um, uh, secondly, yeah, these, these statistics I, I was not aware of are staggering. The lack of any sex ed in elementary schools and, and as Councilmember Bender said, 25% mm -hmm. of, of uh, middle schools and high school, or is it 25% or is it one quarter? I guess that's my first question. It's about 25%. Um, again, oh. again, that was for the charter and alternative schools. And again, because the landscape changes year by year, schools open and close, we don't have a current analysis of that. But it's pretty typical that um, that's the first thing to go in terms of uh, investments in right. those schools. And mm -hmm. for those that do have sex education, mm -hmm. uh, the duration is one quarter? 
I was mixing up the one quarter oh, and the yeah, 25%. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I get it. So for Minneapolis high schools, there's one quarter of a year yeah. for health. But yeah, that's abysmal. Um, mm -hmm. That's absolutely abysmal, especially for a topic oh. that for all intents and purposes serves uh, arguably uh, as much long-term impact as mm -hmm. math or science or even reading. Uh, so uh, yeah, that's, that's insane. But the, so secondly, I think you mentioned that there was no steadfast curriculum base at the state level. There's no standards. Okay. So Minnesota has standards for history, math, science, and right. graduation requirements. There are no um, universally accepted state standards for Minnesota. Yeah, so here's what I remember in sex ed, and granted it probably has changed quite a bit since when I was in middle school and high school, uh, but I, I remember being predominantly about uh, here are the internal processes of how a baby is made. Mm -hmm. And that was, for all intents and purposes, worthless at the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I wasn't going to be a doomer or a midwife or a doctor, and I was pretty clear on that back then. Uh, however, you know, the, the, this, the, the tried and true standards of how to put on a condom and uh, how to or how to not to get somebody pregnant, uh, I think is absolutely critical. And as I recall, we didn't learn a whole lot about that, or at the, at the very least it was made so ambiguous that it wasn't clear at all. Um, not to mention all the, you know, STDs and everything else. Um, so if, I, I would strongly support getting that on our IGR agenda uh, going forward, because obviously some really serious changes need to be made. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Chair and members of the Council. I do also want to call out, um, there's really important preventative work that we can do in the elementary, middle school, and high school years. We also want to focus on the 18 to 24 year old population, and especially those that aren't connected to workforce um, opportunities, employment opportunities, or education opportunities, because we know that the disparities hide. Yeah, that, and that's, I agree, and that was going to be my next question. Okay. So after high school is done and you've graduated, mm -hmm. how practically does it look? Um, I mean, you, you, you're setting up on the street corner in a convenience store or you're going through a, a sports team. How, I, I'm, I'm really open to some, a lot of input as to how you structure those investments to get the most bang for your buck. Mm -hmm. Be a, well, I know, I know some of that. Yeah, I want to see if we have anybody else who wants to speak on that as well. But I'll just say, um, we know that there's a lot of community-based, culturally specific programming that we can do to get to the right populations. A lot of the street outreach that is done um, occasionally includes additional health interventions, and so we know Youth Link and other organizations who work with homeless and highly mobile youth um, also have access to those health education services as well. Um, but again, there's not any sort of targeted specific thing that we're currently doing aside from we have a small contract with neighborhood health source we're seeing on the streets that is implementing basically the skeleton of a program that existed about 10 years ago that was significantly funded through the federal government and so until we have additional investments um, we're really we need people who are connected to the community so again the education of community health workers who are available in neighborhoods to do that work would be really important chair members of the committee yeah, there was a lot of, I mean, a lot of, I heard over and over, people should be walking around with condoms and the ability to test, and, you know, and there was really, that it, it does sound like outside of traditional systems, and I think that's the whole thing is that what we found in just our general work is that the young people who don't go to organizations are probably disconnected on multiple levels, and so to come to a clinic is probably going to carry some of the same stigma or um, just kind of emotional disconnection that comes with any, connecting to any organization. So while we, you know, the, a big strength of this project was that we were able to connect with young people through peer networks and not just organizational networks, whereas, you know, you usually connect with the young people who are already at the organization. When you do research with young people, you can connect through peer networks to young people who are not going to be at the organization to do the interview. And so what we found is that, yeah, like a lot of people are like, well, we should be walking, people should be walking around. We should have workers who are out or there should be this guy I know should have that, you know, those, that equipment and the, those supplies or those, that capacity because he's already out here. I see him every day, but you know, there was yeah. a lot of like street based or the, like, again, the example of like the little lending library, these kind of spaces that may not be, you know, concrete, you know, brick and mortar, but. Are, are there and are actually probably the biggest contact points for young people who are already disconnected, who are probably, you know, the most vulnerable in, in this kind of study and, and to these kind of um, infections and, and so on, disease. Thank you. 
Councilmember Bender. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I may have missed that, this in the presentation, but I wondered how this work was funded, if it was part of our mm -hmm. health department city funded budget or outside funded. So yeah, in 2015, yeah, we, we, we pushed internally to get the money to, to um, invest in this research project. So in 2015, we did fund this project through general funds. Um, moving forward, it wasn't, it wasn't like a placeholder for funding. So our hope is that as we elevate this issue, um, we'll also be hoping to get some investments in the mayor's budget for 2017. So in the past, uh, have we funded any uh, anything else? Have we ever funded um, street outreach workers to help <laughs> with uh, address this very issue? And could you share a little of that history with us? Um, not necessarily this specific issue. We currently have general funds that are um, going to Youth Coordinating Board to help fund the street outreach team for downtown. We do actually provide condoms in kind for them and additional information for clinic services, but it's not their targeted area of expertise. I thought once we had a um, some kind of contract through the uh, Red Door Clinic TAMS before it closed, and I think we had some uh, male sexual health outreach workers who are providing education mm -hmm. on the street. That is the Seen on the Streets program that I mentioned. Um, that's not being currently funded through the city general fund. That's through local public health dollars. No, actually, it's maternal and child health. Oh, maternal and child health. Yeah. So it is being funded right now? Yes, but it's very, it's nothing compared to what we had when we had our large federal grant that was, yes. that was focused on outreach with young men. It's basically funding that's going to uh, one um, community health clinic. And they're, 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 it's very strategic in terms of what they do with their outreach. It's, some is in the school and some is in the street. But really, when you think about um, the approaches that um, the young people are talking about, we're talking about n young men. And if you think about men in general and accessing health care and maybe your annual exam, if your wife encourages to go, that's typically what happens. And so you have to think out of the box in terms of uh, how do you provide this type of education? And actually with outreach, we end up getting our bang for our buck because it's not really teaching about healthy sexuality and positive relationships, but it's also engaging young men on the street, uh, which could also be a violence deterrent as well. And it, it it ripples over in, into so many other things that we're talking about as far as high risk factors uh, with this population. Got it. Thank you. And it sounds like there were even um, just ripple effects from doing the research project and engaging so many youth in doing this. When I did my hashtag, uh, one of the things I found here, this is the um, strength for, for MPLS. I gained strength from the Northside research team. Um, oh, these guys have been a home away from home for me. I've grown from learning and accepting them as members of, in my life for so many different aspects and have gained so much. So that's a pretty powerful that's thing to see posted mm -hmm. here that's just, just doing this work. And in fact, them. you're getting kids excited about science when <laughs> and it's in a different form in terms mm -hmm. of imp uh, impact on the population too. So, yeah. I did notice there's a set of um, recommendations um, mm -hmm. And I was just curious, what was the plan? What, who's responsible for trying to implement those recommendations? Or is there a sense that the health department's gonna hold on to these and move forward with them? I did hear from mm -hmm. committee members, there seemed to be some interest in pushing recommendation mm -hmm. A over to the IGR committee or something. Mm -hmm. I don't know that we have a motion on that, but what, is, what are your thoughts? Well, yeah, I know um, we have a dedicated adolescent health and research division. Well. Youth Development Division, and so as a part of our business plan and our alignment with the city goals, we're definitely invested in pushing this work with adolescent sexual health. We're continually looking for pots of funding to help support these specific strategies. And so um, we we just applied for EHDI funding from the state, and we're always looking for additional pots of funding that really focus on comprehensive strategies for prevention and intervention and so um, this is one part of the game plan as well as just elevating this issue with you guys and hoping that you know as we look towards the 2017 uh, general fund budget that it's something that we consider for investment for young people. I think the other piece of that too is also sharing this information with the community and it mm -hmm. is I hope to um, take the message that we learn from the young people that uh, participate in this project and sharing it with uh, 
other community-based organizations as well. Um, it's not just about teen pregnancy, pregnancy prevention, and it's not just about teaching people about uh, sexually transmitted infections, but it is really about healthy sexuality and also uh, messaging that resonates with young people too and get into those places and spaces where, where they are as opposed to expecting young people to always come to a particular agency. I appreciate that and I, uh, it m might be that I'm um, connecting this research with the Youth Congress and with the Youth Coordinating Board might be somewhere to go to in mm -hmm. the months ahead as we move forward. Um, and I think I'm just going to um, leave it up to uh, council members to think about whether we should try to look at our legislative agenda maybe and talk to um, our IGR staff and see where, where it makes sense and how could we fit in with maybe helping get those best practices there. Mm -hmm. um, Sometimes I wish that our school-based clinics had more capacity so we could start offering health uh, classes or workshops for teachers or, or for students or maybe even reaching down to middle school and saying, could we come in and do part of an educational opportunity? But I know where things are strapped pretty low. But, um, well, again, Chair and members of the committee, I want to thank you so much for listening to our presentation today and also thank our partners at Youth Crisis and the Youth Research Consultants who did really amazing, really progressive work that we're really happy to share with our stakeholders. Thank you so much and thanks for everybody who uh, got up and presented to us and everybody who didn't and thank you. engaged in the work. <laughs> so I think I'll just move to receive and file this then. Um, any discussion on that? All those in favor say aye. Any opposed say no. That motion carries then. Now we're ready to move on with our uh, next agenda item. Uh, I'll have to get back to my agenda here. I think we're on the uh, seventh item here. And this is the Minneapolis Greenhouse Gas Emissions Reduction Goal. And we're going to get some results from a city performance tool. Uh, and Ms. Press will begin the presentation. Welcome. Thank you. Um, Chair, council members, my name is Gail Prest. I'm the sustainability director at the city of Minneapolis. And we're here today to talk the results of modeling the city of Minneapolis's greenhouse gas emissions reduction goal of 80% by 2050. You may remember in early 2014, the city council passed a revised greenhouse gas emissions reduction target, adding 80% by 2050, which is an incredibly ambitious goal. Um, at the same time, the state and Hennepin County have passed this goal. And um, I think uh, what we are trying to do here today is to walk you through some modeling, looking at technology, not at policies, on what it would take to achieve this goal. Um, this morning, we actually met with um, other stakeholders, including CPED, Public Works, and the Health Department, different agencies, the University of Minnesota, some NGOs to walk through this, this information in much more detail. Um, <coughs> And then we also invited today members from the Energy Vision Advisory Committee and the Community uh, Environmental um, Advisory Commission. If you guys want to raise your hand and also from the University of Minnesota, they're going to be listening to the presentation and then immediately following, we're going to go over to room 319 to have a larger conversation. Um, I'd like to thank especially Siemens and Julia Thanes will be giving this. Um, Siemens has this new tool she'll tell you about that's free and open source. They did this work pro bono for us. It took over a year to do. Brennan Slaughterback, who's no longer with the city, was very instrumental with this. Kelly Molman of our staff is here. She was very helpful, and Siri Simons um, has also been helpful on this. So we're excited to present this to you. I think it's um, important to remember that this is a starting point. This was a pretty high-level overview of what it's going to take. But we think that this is going to be very informative as we move forward with the Clean Energy Partnership, as we move forward with the Comprehensive Plan for 2040, and also as we look at um, what it's going to take to, to reach our Climate Action Plan. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Julia. Thank you very much. Welcome. Thank you. Chair, members of the committee, my name is Julia Thing, and I'm Director of Urban Development for Siemens Center for Cities. So normally I'd be very intimidated to come after a presentation that's been the best presentation in two and a quarter years. Um, but I think today actually, it's really good to be able to have first a presentation on something pretty short term, very local, and now a presentation on something long term. So looking to Minneapolis in 2050, these visionary sustainability targets, and then actually how you take those short term, medium term, 
and long-term actions to getting to that 80 by 50 or this 80% greenhouse gas emissions reduction by 2050 goal. Gail mentioned that we started this project over a year ago, and that's absolutely accurate. Um, and when we started this project, we were working with only a few cities. Um, now we're working with more than 20 cities across the world, and by next year we'll be working with more than 40 cities across the world. Um, but the reason that we came to Minneapolis with this city performance tool, so with this software model that's um, supposed to help city makers, city decision makers, with long-term strategic planning around sustainability. Um, and the reason that we approached Minneapolis is because we knew two things. Um, one, that Minneapolis was really a leading city in sustainability in the U.S. And second, that Minneapolis was a city that wasn't afraid to look at the results and be honest about them. So wasn't afraid to be able to do some of these modeling um, projects to work with the private sector and to be able to say, okay, well, maybe even if we throw all of these technologies at Minneapolis, um, then we're still not gonna reach this 80 by 50 target. So the good news is that even after doing this project, even after looking at the results of the city performance tool, what we found is that it is possible for Minneapolis to achieve this 80 by 50 target. I mentioned that we've been working with more than 20 cities across the world, and we haven't yet had a result like this one. So we've had results where people haven't been able to, or cities haven't been able to achieve this 80 by 50 target. Um, we've looked, worked with cities like Copenhagen with Helsinki about shorter term targets that they now have publicly acknowledged that they're not going to meet. But this was the first time in the first analysis that we really saw 80 by 50 is achievable. But it's achievable only with a lot of effort. So the number one recommendation out of this was to continue cleaning the electricity mix. Um, and fortunately, we had the support of the Clean Energy Partnership, the support of Excel Energy and Centerpoint when we were doing this analysis. So that was one of the first recommendations. Um, the second was looking around electric transport. So once you have this cleaner electricity mix, then how do you start moving a transportation system so it's more about electric, electrification of transportation? And then the third was around having the city be a leader in terms of energy efficiency in buildings. And you'll see specifically some of the building technologies that we had recommended, um, but then also just this idea of the city being a leader around actually implementing some of the technologies. So just to give you some context, this analysis came just at the point as the Clean Energy Partnership was announced, just at the point as, and actually we were midway through the project when Excel announced that they were going to be revising their clean energy proposal and moving it up towards this 65% clean energy mix. Um, so this was a really great moment to be working with the City of Minneapolis' sustainability office to look at uh, technology pathways to 80 by 50. So we showed, you know, not only that uh, continuing on this clean electricity mix was the, the way to go in terms of reaching 80 by 50, but also that additional measures would be needed to take, would be needed um, for, uh, in order to reach this 80 by 50 target. So there would need to be the uptake and implementation of 40 building and transport technologies on top of that cleaning of the electricity mix. And as I mentioned before, um, electrification of transport was one of the major things we looked at, as well as improving energy efficiency in buildings. So just to give you a little bit of background information about the city performance tool itself. Um, this is a software model that Siemens has been developing over a number of years. Um, and the reason we developed it is because we saw cities deciding to take sustainability into their own hands and setting some very ambitious sustainability targets. So we were trying to figure out what is Siemens' role in supporting urban sustainability. I mean, it's really great that actually as a company, we've pledged to be carbon neutral. Um, but what can we do to help cities figure out how they get to these ambitious sustainability targets? Um, the way that we knew how to do that best was through technology. So through looking at energy and buildings and transportation and understanding whether or not there were technologies that could be customized to a city context um, in order to then uh, help with energy efficiency, help with reducing emissions from electricity, help with getting people maybe off the road and into uh, public transportation. So we also wanted to make sure that we were looking at indicators that matter to cities. Um, so one of the main things that we are talking about in this particular study is CO2 equivalent emissions. Um, and that was because we were looking at this 80 by 50 target. Um, but certainly any of the technologies that have carbon emissions implications 
uh, have air quality implications as well. Um, and they also have jobs and they have cost implications. Uh, so we definitely looked through the lens of um, the, green, the sustainability, holistic sustainability, and looking at green both from an environmental perspective and from an economic perspective. We're supporting more than 20 cities worldwide. So uh, again, this number is going to grow to probably close to 40 and maybe even more next year. Um, but this, uh, one of the, the benefits of doing this analysis and being, being able to work with Minneapolis um, so closely on this is that we were then able to pick and choose best practices from across the world in terms of what people are learning from the CYPT results and then how they're moving it forward. And as I go through some of the results, I'll also kind of reference what's happening in Asia, um, where we're working with cities like Seoul, um, Nanjing, Wuhan, um, what we're doing in Europe, where we're working with London, Helsinki, Copenhagen, and then what we're doing in North America, where we are just finishing up a project with San Francisco and have been working with Boston and Portland and DC as well. So in terms of why Minneapolis decided to use the CYPT, um, we covered this before, but really this came at a, a good moment in terms of the Clean Energy Partnership, in terms of getting ready for maybe a new round of climate action planning. Um, and so Gail was very much trying to use, Gail and, and Brendan and Kelly, I should say, were very much trying to use the CYPT as a, you know, an informational educational tool around how technology could impact the city of Minneapolis. We took a snapshot of um, some of the stats from Minneapolis today. And uh, I won't go through the exact um, data on this slide, other than to say that when we looked across CYPT cities, two of the things that stood out the most is that really in all US cities, electricity consumption per capita was much higher than in other places. And then the average household size, so the square footage for an average household um, was much larger. So when we were looking towards the results, we were really thinking about land use, density, and all the other considerations that go into um, then creating a kind of holistic plan around policy and technology implementation. Um, the final thing is that the, this public transit mode share. So um, when you, as we're looking through these slides, the mode share that we're referencing is not journeys, it's passenger miles traveled. So it's a little bit number, a little bit different number than probably what you've seen around mode share. Um, but what we're seeing in cities like Minneapolis or other um, US cities is that, of course, the public transit mode share is much lower than um, when you're looking at Europe or when you're looking at Asia. So when it comes to that, actually, uh, the electric cars, the electric vehicles have had much higher results than they've had in other parts of the world simply by virtue of the fact that we're more reliant on car transport. So in that mode share, what's the rest of it then? If 6% is public transit, how, how much do you break down the other 94% into what main categories? 92% of that is car transport, and then the remainder is split among um, cycling, walking, and then other types of transportation. So in terms of the analysis, we start by creating a baseline, an emissions baseline. Um, and the reason I'm showing you this slide is twofold. Um, one is that we tried to be as accurate as possible to Minneapolis's published greenhouse gas emissions inventory. And we actually got pretty darn close. Um, so rounded up 4.5 million metric tons is what we found under the CYPT. And that's the same rounded up as from the uh, community-wide greenhouse gas emissions inventory. We also found that a little more than half of the emissions were from buildings. So again, when we were looking at the different technologies, we focused um, a fair bit on buildings in terms of trying to pick out what might have the most impact in reducing emissions. Um, transportation was a little under half. Then when we broke down the emissions um, by the, the various categories, we found again that um, residential buildings, passenger tra transport, especially car transport, and then road freight transport were the main three culprits in terms of producing emissions in Minneapolis. And this is the city of Minneapolis. So we kept our boundary pretty tight in terms of looking at just what was happening within Minneapolis itself. What does infrastructure in, in terms of transport, that, you don't think of infrastructure as um, burning fossil fuels? Uh, that would be the street lights and the traffic lights. So okay. the electricity that's powering those lights. Okay. Uh, Councilmember Bender has a question too. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
I don't want to forget this question. So it may be later and it may be something to follow up about, but I'm curious about the idea of using passenger miles as the mode share. And I think that makes sense, but I'm also interested in how long, we have a very sprawling region with lots of long car trips. And so I think that's partly why we're seeing such high percentages of <clears throat> vehicle miles travel. So I'm interested in the greenhouse gas emissions um, impact of our short trips, because I actually also think that we have a lot of opportunity in our region and especially in Minneapolis to replace shorter trips, five miles, three miles, one mile or less with non-motorized trips or transit trips. So you could answer now or later, or yeah. we could talk later. Yeah, absolutely. No, I'd be happy to talk with you a little bit more about why we chose passenger miles traveled. Um, but in short, it's really about modeling the technologies and understanding mode shift from moving to maybe a car where there's a single occupant to moving to something on public transit where there's, you know, 150 occupants. So that's the reason why we chose passenger miles traveled. Um, I think the other thing that is definitely a follow-on analysis from the CYPT is to do something that's more GIS based. So the CYPT is citywide and we don't look at geography, but something like the comment you just made about short term and uh, sh short trips and long trips is absolutely spot on. And it's the type of thing that certainly when you're diving deeper into the analysis, you would want to look at. Um, absolutely. Council Member Fry might have another question on the same sure. slide. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, now, these these statistics apply whether or not the um, the trip originated within the city, right? So the way that we looked at it is um, we looked at trips originating in the city. We looked at trips originating out of the city, outside of right. the city, and so coming that, into the no. city. But we only look at the portion that happens within the city. So it could be that the person's coming from outside of the city coming in, and then we try to look at the portion of their trip that's within the city. So that's it'll helpful. be residents outside of the city Thank as you. well. So this was our essential question, this 80 by 50 question. And when we were talking about building energy scenarios or building scenarios, infrastructure scenarios, to get to this 80 by 50 target, um, we came up with three different ways that we were going to look at the effects of the technologies. And they were all related to how aggressive um, Minneapolis would be cleaning its electricity mix. So we had the control where everything stayed the same, the electricity mix stayed the same as, in, uh, as it was today. Um, we had the Excel Energy revised proposal extension, so that's basically taking what Excel Energy has proposed um, and then extending it out to 2050. Um, so you'll see that this is a much more uh, aggressive mix in terms of wind adoption and then uh, solar PV panels uh, and, and adoption of, of rooftop PV panels. Um, the third scenario was this climate champion scenario. Um, because we were doing the modeling without really knowing what the results were going to be, we wanted to have a very aggressive uh, electricity mix that we put in there as well. So then when you look at uh, just the, the baseline emissions, these three energy scenarios without applying any CYPT technologies, um, what you see uh, at the top is this um, yellow dotted line, and that's the baseline for 2006, um, and that's when it, Minneapolis uses as its benchmark for the greenhouse gas inventory. Um, you see that dark purple line, that's just the control. Um, you see a kind of medium uh, pink line, that's the Excel Energy Revised Proposal Extension, and then this bottom line, the Climate Champion, um, which is the, the most aggressive. So just in terms of numbers um, alone, when you're just looking at the electricity mixes, you get some reduction already. Um, when you then layer on 40 of the CYPT technologies, so 40 of the 73 that were available in the tool, um, all of a sudden you see that the control drops down considerably, considerably as does um, the Excel Energy Revised Proposal Extension and the Climate Champion. So um, looking at the actual numbers with this, um, even if you go with our slightly more conservative um, second scenario, you get an 82% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, and this is the 80 by 50 achievement. So in terms of the technologies that were actually a part of this process, um, I clearly won't read through all of them, um, but the point of this slide is, you know, that you can certainly uh, read it after the presentation, um, but I wanted to point out a couple of different technologies on here, um, just to give you a flavor of what's in the tool. 
So there are some things in the tool that are more low hanging fruit. It's the LED lighting maybe in resident, uh, residential buildings. Um, there are some that are a little bit more difficult, um, building out the EBRT, um, so the bus rapid transit network within the city. Um, but what we tried to do was to take the city's existing plans or Metro's existing plans um, and then just push them to their limits. So we were trying to go for something that was ambitious but not unachievable. When we looked at the carbon impacts themselves, at which were the technologies that most affected um, carbon emissions and reductions of carbon emissions, uh, things like the building envelope, so adding wall insulation, adding window glazing, things that are like not that exciting but actually do a really good job in, in terms of improving the building stock and reducing emissions, um, were very high up there in terms of the results. Uh, the other thing that was very high up there in terms of results was electric cars. Um, so it was sort of the residential building envelope, the non-residential building envelope, looking at building automation and improving building automation, um, meaning having automatic adjustment of lights, having automatic adjustment of blinds, um, being able to sense number of occupants in a room and adjust the temperature accordingly. Those are the types of things that we've been talking about with increased building automation. Um, with the electric cars, we modeled about a 65 percent um, share of the total car fleet in Minneapolis as being electric cars. So that equates to about 200,000 200, additional e-cars, and they would probably replace the conventional cars that we have now. But that's a lot of, that's a lot of new cars. Um, we also looked at some of the freight transport results. So one of the highest that we saw was e-highway, and that's when you have a fully electric or a hybrid electric truck that um, connects and disconnects to an overhead catenary line that's usually ro running along a highway. So it's something that's being piloted in the US actually outside of the ports of Long Beach and LA um, in Carson, California. We've got a test track there seeing whether or not the impacts that we projected for this e-highway are as, as um, high as we, we think they might be. Could I just ask, is this e-highway concept something that could work for BRT as well? Yes. Yep. So then we also looked at job impacts. Um, and we look at, uh, we try to look at the local impacts of installing, maintaining, and operating the infrastructure. And when you look at that lens of the, uh, the economic impacts of uh, implementing the infrastructure, by far and away, the most impactful technologies are really around transportation, and they are the, the big ticket items like building out new metro lines. Um, they also require you know, uh, being able to do local hiring, um, particularly when it comes to building technologies. So that's sort of something that uh, we kept in mind as we were doing the analysis. What types of skills would you need in order to build out some of these technologies? So when you say metro new lines, are you meaning light rail lines or just bus lines? or? Light rail. Light rail, okay. Yeah, so we're talking about light and, rail. And what is the difference between light rail and tram? So uh, we have the light rail versus the streetcar. Streetcar is the tram? Yes, okay. exactly. Yeah, Thank sorry, you. difference in terminology, European right. and <laughs> American. Yes. So then finally, we focused on a few high impact technologies. Um, so uh, we wanted to look at what does a stepwise approach towards 80 by 50 really mean? Um, it's a set out some of the technologies that we thought were kind of consistent with the short term, medium term, and long term approach. So one of the first things we looked at was energy efficiency and automation in buildings and having the public sector be a leader in that. Um, the second thing we looked at was combined heat and power. So this is moving towards kind of a distributed energy or district energy um, system in uh, probably specifically downtown Minneapolis, but this was geographically agnostic. Um, the third was looking in, at reduction in car demand. So this is not a technology per se, but this was just a, a question of if you take people out of cars and put them onto public transit or other modes, what happens to emissions? Um, and then the final thing was looking at electric cars. So I'll sort of run through these next few slides because I think they're probably um, better viewed after the presentation. Um, but there's a couple of different energy efficiency and uh, automation technologies that really rose to the fore in terms of being the most impactful. Um, one was this building automation, um, as we mentioned, or as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, really looking at um, taking choices, I guess, out of 
uh, sort of individual's hands and automating some of the processes within buildings around temperature, around lighting, and that sort of thing. Um, and that had quite a large impact, even when just looking at non-residential buildings. So it was about 8% reduction. 8% of the overall reductions were attributable to this. Um, the next was looking more at retro commissioning of buildings and at uh, figuring out when you go into build existing buildings and try to make them operate better, what are the results? Um, and that was around 4% of the total reductions. And then we looked at the residential building envelope. Um, and I think, you know, this one was interesting for us because there was uh, some of the highest reductions, 10% uh, of overall reductions, um, would be uh, achieved if you implemented this, uh, the building envelope. So again, wall insulation and window glazing in 100% of the households. Um, and between today and 2050, that would require about a $20,000 uh, investment. And that's both capital expenditure and operating expenditure per household. Then we looked at combined heat and power. We looked at um, transferring some of the uh, heating mix over to combined heat and power, um, making the generation of heater, heating more efficient. Um, and this was probably the, the top lever in terms of emissions reductions that we, we looked at specifically um, with a 13% reduction in overall emissions. And then finally, we looked at uh, reduction in car demand, what it would mean to shift 10% of the mode share to all other modes. Um, and we got uh, actually slightly lower um, emissions uh, reductions that we, than we expected. And we think this is largely because, um, first of all, this doesn't consider electric transport. Um, but secondly, because uh, there's already just so much um, car transport that even shifting just 10% didn't do as much as we as we considered. And then finally, we looked at electric cars. So again, this was around a 13% reduction in overall emissions just due to switching the car fleet um, to 60% of 65% of the car fleet being electric cars. So what does this mean in terms of what happens to Minneapolis in 2050? What does this mean in terms of building infrastructure? Um, what we found, and these same numbers are duplicated on the next, oh, sorry. Um, what we found is that uh, today, you would have to in increase the number of electric vehicles on the road by approximately 230,000 uh, electric vehicles in order to reach this 80 by 50. Um, at the same time, and this is based on, on studies that were done in other cities, um, you would have to build about 70,000 public charging um, stations. So uh, around a three to one ratio in terms of charging stations to electric vehicles. And this might go down over time um, and certainly would go down as technology uh, improves. Um, but, uh, you know, that's sort of a, a good leveling point um, for understanding what this kind of infrastructure would mean. Um, you'd have to uh, build out the bike share network put more bikes in a bike share network, um, create more protected bike lanes. So uh, move towards uh, 200 miles of protected bike lanes from I think it's 25 today. Um, and then there would be a, a pretty significant reduction in both the um, electricity consumption and the heating consumption between today and 2050. So um, the CYPT didn't actually take into consideration some of the cost savings um, of, of reducing your energy consumption. Um, but we've got a very basic estimate of what the annual savings would be equal to um, if you did this jump, uh, this decrease in electricity consumption and heating consumption. And then finally, um, when you're talking about uh, moving towards electric transportation or electrification of transportation, there's of course then this rebalancing some additional uh, electricity that would be needed. So one of the main things that we talked about this morning is um, what it means to the grid in terms of uh, adding additional electri electricity um, to the grid from things like EV chargers. So can I just ask, is there a certain assumption with the electric vehicles that now the coal has been phased out or we're getting all this electricity from wind or solar or is, is So that... the assumption is that the coal has been phased out and that the uh, electricity mix would be the electricity mix that we have under our revised scenario. So it would be, um, I think, 30% from wind, 
13%, sorry, 40% from wind, 13% from solar. And then the remainder would be um, from nuclear, from natural gas, and there would be no coal. Okay. So it's a much cleaner electricity mix. And then finally, we had a, just a couple of facts related to these uh, energy uh, savings from buildings. So um, essentially, when you're using these energy efficiency technologies, you all of a sudden um, have annual electricity savings and annual heating savings that uh, equate to um, the current consumption in more than 160,000 homes, more than 185,000 homes. The final thing is just that, you know, what does this mean in terms of moving people out of cars and into public transport? Um, uh, these technologies would require that people, um, of course, take other public transit options as well as move to more pedestrianism and cycling. Um, and we projected that the mode share in this, as it relates to uh, passenger miles traveled, would be shifted from 92% car to 57%. So this is a pretty big behavioral change um, related to people using uh, more public transit. So that's larger than the 10% you had in your slide earlier, right? Yes, so um, this takes into consideration all of the technologies. It's not only this 10% reduction in car demand, it's also adding um, new metro lines, new BRT, et cetera. So it's the synergies of all of the technologies as opposed to the earlier estimate, which was just the individual impact of the technology or the policy. And that is it. <laughs> Excellent. So we've um, actually got another report after this if you're worried about taking off. So, um, I'm curious, what technologies all did you look at? Um, we've now got a company that's putting in, for example, um, they're gonna be running water through the sewer system to create a um, district energy system where they're cooling or heating the water a certain degree. And then there's people interested in geothermal and those kinds of things. It looks like some of those haven't been, weren't part of this. Um, right. or, or were they, um, could you just talk a little bit more? Of yeah, yeah, so those were certainly complementary studies to what we were doing with the CYPT. Um, we focused mainly on the buildings and transport technologies as opposed to the energy technologies. Um, so the two energy technologies, I guess three energy technologies that we focused on were wind, um, PV power, and then CHP, so combined heat and power. Um, but we didn't do the, the analysis of kind of district cooling and heating. Um, the, on the buildings and transport side, um, they were, at least for the buildings, um, in two categories. One was sort of improving the building envelope, so things like wall insulation. Um, the second was building automation. So um, starting to uh, look at existing buildings and figuring out how you can optimize performance of those buildings, and then actually installing technologies that then would automate some of what was happening either in the room or networks of rooms. Um, in terms of transportation, we tried to look at um, the things that ranged from kind of cycling interventions, whether it was more protected bike lanes, more bike share, um, versus some of the larger passenger transport. Um, so that would be like the new LRT or um, uh, looking at expanding uh, bus rapid transit, um, looking at switching the bus fleet over to either electric buses or to CNG buses. Um, and those were um, some of the main things that we looked at. Fantastic. Um, I think we have some more questions. Councilmember Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I really, really appreciate the presentation and all the data in it. My question for you is around uh, looking at future technologies. I was wondering specifically around self-driving cars. Mm -hmm. To what level that's factored? I mean, for the price of, let's just say, you know, in 10 years, they're $50,000 each. Well, for the price of the Southwest Light Rail line, that's 36,000 cars that right. you could potentially have that are municipally or government uh, uh, owned as a public transit option that people could press a button and it could show up at your house within one minute right. and take anywhere you need to go and then go plug itself back into the solar panels. So yep. I could see something like that really changing human behavior quite a bit and ultimately leading a lot of people to not need cars uh, right. because they have that option available. How do you weigh that in? I mean, obviously there's a lot of uncertainty mm -hmm. around these kind of future technologies, right. solar breakthrough, all that kind of stuff. Um, but what are your thoughts on that? 
Yeah, absolutely. So we get this question a lot about how do autonomous vehicles factor into CYPT. Um, so for this particular analysis, we didn't take them into consideration other than to say that we knew that that was probably going to be a reality for 2050 um, and so would bear further investigation. Um, in other cities that we've worked in, we've uh, modeled autonomous vehicles in a slightly different way. So uh, not to get too technical about it, but basically we've adjusted the model to look at increased utilization of cars. Um, and to understand what it means when you have essentially more car sharing or car pooling rather. Um, so, you know, just speaking more from a personal opinion, I think that moving towards car sharing, moving towards autonomous vehicles is something that will be part of this integrated multimodal system. Um, and the CYPT can capture that, um, but for this particular project is not. All right, thank you. Council Member Bender. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I wondered if, um, if you looked at land use policies as part of this study, it seems not. And I think that that would help give more hope to the possibility of transportation mode shifting being a more effective um, strategy. And I, not to discount the reality that you're acknowledging that a lot of people are driving long distances in our region. And realistically, maybe the technology piece is the more effective in the short term. Uh, but we're about to update our comprehensive plan. We have policies about directing growth to transit corridors, but frankly, our implementing policies, our zoning code could use some work in really reflecting that if that's truly our policy goal. And so I think there is a lot of opportunity in Minneapolis to better align our land use policies within our region, our transportation policies like investments like the Southwest Corridor with higher density housing. Um, so I don't know, did, I wondered if this looked at that and then again to your other point, maybe that's kind of a next step as we look at our comprehensive plan update. Absolutely. So um, I guess two things. The first is that when Siemens was coming up with this tool, we tried to stick to what we knew. So in terms of land use, I mean, obviously we come up across land use all the time when we're doing projects, but that was not something we wanted to embed into the tool because that is certainly a kind of a local and policymaker decision. Um, just on the other side, from a completely personal point of view, and my background is as an urban designer and as uh, being in, trained in economic development, land use is an integral piece of the puzzle. And um, in other CYPT projects we've done, we have integrated land use in some form or fashion by basically projecting out that people will use less square footage per person. So their homes will be smaller, their offices may be smaller. Um, so we've looked at making the cities more dense um, in the future, and that has definitely uh, given us more positive results in terms of emissions reductions. Thank you. And I think there was, uh, I guess you talked about the average early on, which was kind of a land use issue. So there was a little bit of that in there that we could think about. Um, I just think this is fantastic. I'm curious, is the PowerPoint, the um, is that the representation of all the information in the data? Or is there another report that people should get their hands on if they want to dig into it more deeply? Yeah, so right now we have, and actually I could probably let Gail answer this question as well. Um, but right now we have the PowerPoint is just the visualization of some of the data. Um, then we also have a set of data um, that was publicly available uh, data that we used for the project itself. So there's a, a data set. And the, the city might have that on their website for people to access at some point? Uh, Council member, the goal is to have a web page up by the end of the week and uh, link it and let others know all about it as well. And we've got the university here who's really interested in taking the data and looking at it more closely. I think we have um, the state as part of their looking at 80 by 2050. Hopefully they'll evaluate it closely as well. So I think another really interesting topic is the work that Julie has been doing across the world and how the different cities have different levers, different policies, different interests, depends on what their electric mix is. If you're Seattle, it's hydro, what do you do? But um, those reports are starting to come out on the um, Siemens website. So we'll be able to look and see what's Mexico City doing? What's Copenhagen doing? What are, what's San Francisco should be out shortly so that we can learn more and compare to and try to learn from each other. Wonderful. Very interesting stuff. I'm also curious to think about our climate action plan that we have and should this information go into that and are we supposed to look at making adjustments um, based on this? So that will be something to to look forward to um, and to look at. And also, it's obvious to me now that um, 80 is not high enough. 
<laughs> um, and, and I always look at those graphs and I wonder when are we going to actually admit that we can get to 100. And there was a nice slide that was showing the trajectory and 100 wasn't very far far off because once you're at 86, I mean, what is that? So did you get a chance to figure out what year you think we could get to 100? No, we didn't. <laughs> okay. Next time. Right. And of course, we're always interested in what are the policy levers. Um, we can um, try to encourage uh, the city to buy electric cars to replace their fleet, or when we're doing our next building, we can try to make sure that envelope is really thick, um, and those kinds of things when we're, we're building. But um, as we you look at this and you think about what are policy recommendations, what difference could we make, um, and we'll also be thinking about it based on this. That could be significant. You were kind of hinting at a few with a, a infrastructure for plug-in cars, and obviously um, we could see that our street lights and our intersections were, were costing uh, a lot in terms of fossil fuels and that. So um, there's some of those things we can dig out of here too. I just really appreciate the information. This is pretty exciting. Um, and, and Maybe there can be a race. Do you think we have a chance of uh, getting to 80% before Copenhagen and San Francisco and stuff? We're trying. All right. <laughs> Let's do it. Thank you. I'll just make a staff direction and we'll have that done. All right, Kim? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to move to receive and file this. And also, um, people are going to meet across the hall and they'll talk about this further. We do have another issue that we're going to discuss here at the committee too. But on the motion to receive and file, is there any discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? That motion carries. And um, lastly then, um, we want to get a uh, report on our um, Minnesota Department of Health evaluation. Um, we have, uh, we license our city's food, lodging, and pools. And we're kind of delegated with that authority from the state. And I know we've been working hard on that since our last time we were evaluated. And we're going to get a report today from Mr. Huff. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair, council members. <clears throat> Excuse me. I know you have been waiting excitedly for a report on a state audit. Um, and that's what we have today. Um, the Minneapolis Health Department had the first health inspectors in the state. I love this picture because it shows we used to actually go out to Wisconsin to inspect dairy herds for milk sold in Minneapolis. Um, and uh, we operate today under a state delegation. Um, the state has authority over our state uh, health codes, and they delegate that to Minneapolis to act on their behalf. We have a delegation agreements with both the Minnesota Department of Health and the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. Uh, and our delegation agreement, as with all agreements, it has rights and responsibilities. And one of those uh, responsibilities is that we fulfill the items of the delegation agreement and are then audited by the state to make sure that we're doing that. Um, in 2010, our uh, program was audited by the Minnesota Department of Health, and um, uh, we did not do well in that audit. In fact, uh, my second week in this role, uh, I received a letter in February of 2011 that said this from the then current Director of Environmental Health for Department of Health. Um, and we were subject to termination not the best letter to receive. So um, we're going to talk about what happened and what we've done to fix it. And I am joined today by Ryan Crick, one of our supervisors of environmental health, Cindy Weckworth, another supervisor. We have Tom Hogan, the director of environmental health at the State Department of Health. And a lot of health inspectors are here today as well. If you're uh, on the health inspection staff, can you just raise your hand? So these are the folks that go out and inspect your restaurants every day and work for you. So I wanted them to come today to see a report of their amazing work over the last uh, four and a half years. So Thank you, uh, Ryan. Congratulations, I think, are in order for all of you. Uh, it's a fantastic report. And is unacceptable the worst, <laughs> the worst grade you could get in these reports? Uh, well, subject to ter uh, termination would be termination. Uh, yes. Then unacceptable. Uh, then subject to terminate. Then unacceptable. <coughs> What's the top grade? Levels acceptable. Acceptable. Top grade. Yes. Wow. All right. Okay. Good afternoon, Go Chair Gordon and uh, committee members. 
As you can see, uh, five of the eight standards we did not fare well in. Uh, under the first regulatory standard one, uh, we had issues with inconsistencies on city ordinances and policies where they were inconsistent with state statutes or rules. On our risk-based inspection program, uh, we were not inspecting our facilities at the required frequency per the delegation agreement. Under standard four, uh, we were not, we had issues in how we were documenting some of our inspections and also inconsistencies from one inspector to the next on where violations would be called. Um, some would call under one number, some would call under another number. Uh, in, in standard six, in that area, when they did the field component, uh, they go out and they interview some of the establishments that we inspect. Our establishments did not score well on basic food knowledge and how to handle ill employees once they reported ill in their food establishments. Also under this area, we did have some policies that were, um, I would say not attainable or realistic that weren't being followed on a day-to-day -day basis that needed to be rewritten. Uh, standard three was the area where we needed the greatest improvement. 40% um, of our food establishments were not inspected on time. 73 of our lodging uh, were behind on the frequency and over 50% of our pools were not being required, not being inspected at the required frequency. On 2011, the employee survey summed it up very well. On average, over 50% of the responses were unfavorable on how the department was being run and what direction it was going in. In rebuilding the department, uh, Dan joined us in 2010. At that time, he was uh, our fifth director or interim director within a five-year period. So there was a lot of changes. Um, when he came in, he did uh, eliminate the manager position at that time. Um, we had two supervisor positions that were filled by Cindy Weckworth and myself. He also went and he interviewed all the employees just to have them be able to voice their concerns, any suggestions for improvements. Um, one thing that came out of this that was very valuable was uh, it wasn't an inspector issue. It was more systemic issues within the department and how it had been ran. Uh, we did a lot of work to restore trust amongst management and the employees and amongst coworkers. Uh, we had a very senior staff at that time, I, on average, you know, well over 15 years experience with a few new staff and there, it started to have been more a separation between older and newer staff. So opening up those lines of communication and trust was very important. Uh, we also developed some performance measures that were shared um, with management and us and were posted in our in our office monthly and also discussed with inspectors on a monthly basis. Uh, we had a new office arrangement just to help foster that communication, um, went into quad um, cubes and got a new office area. Uh, environmental values were ins instituted by Dan uh, and then we use these values and our guiding principles daily in our decision making. Uh, within a two year period, we had 18 separate code changes uh, we needed to make sure we were licensing everything we were required to by our delegation agreement. And once we had those established, we needed to make sure that we were inspecting at the right frequency. Uh, we developed uh, variance procedures. Um, everyone likes in Minnesota our outdoor air establishments, the roll up garage doors in our short summer months. Well, per the food code, they have to be minimum of screened in. So we went out and we had around a, a little over 100 establishments that we had to write variances for because they did not have that minimal screening. Also, we had a lot of establishments that were doing specialized processes, like curing meats or sous vide cooking uh, that require added requirements and guidance to make sure that that food is produced safe. We're operating under a 1990 food code. Uh, there's been a lot of changes in how our, operate, our operators um, run their establishment since that time. And if they're doing a procedure outside of that code, we need to write, um, either have a variance for that or have a HACCP plan approved for that process. Also in our Minneapolis, the majority of our establishments are independently owned um, and they don't have corporate policies and procedures. So we need to work with them on those. This was one that we didn't have license. This is a picture of the a twins hot tub. 
Uh, we didn't look at that as a public pool. We were informed by the state, yes, this is a public pool. You must license and inspect it. So if you look down, I think it's the third to last. At least now we are, uh, we are sure that all pregnant women or children have been properly warned before they use the twins hot tub. Uh, one thing we developed was our field guide. So we had a standard operating procedures and how we do our inspections every day. This, this will cover us everything we do from our complaints to our inspections to possibly even when necessary an emergency closure and how we handle that within our department. Uh, this document now has grown to a, it's a 70 page document. Uh, we use marking instructions. Uh, there's over 700 different violations. Some are very, very fine line in what the difference between those violations are. And this is a place to go where we can have, have it written down what are the differences and how we call that violation for the city of Minneapolis. We also implemented peer inspections, which we have once a month to go out and do a peer inspection with a coworker to make sure you're calling the violations consistently and under the right rule. Uh, we also did this last year with Minnesota Department of Health inspectors in the St. Paul area and this year have expanded to Hennepin County. Uh, we have also added three senior health inspectors. Uh, they've been able to be our subject matter experts. They also do report review and ensure that we're being consistent. Uh, when we see inconsistencies on the peer inspections and reports, we have a monthly technical meeting where those are discussed and we make a decision as a department on how we're going to handle that. Uh, this is an interesting chart, and if you look on the left-hand side, in 2002, we had 14 inspectors for over 3,300 establishments. Uh, the FDA recommended that time was 15. As you can see, as we moved to 2012, we had around a 25% increase in establishments that coincided with a little over a 20% decrease in the number of inspectors. On 13, 14, with your support, we were able to add inspection staff to our division, and now to ensure that we can inspect our establishments at the required frequency. These are just showing us the performance measures that we post in our office and go over with inspectors each month. Uh, we have green and inspected by the required time and moves into yellow and red to make sure that we are hitting those. Also the chart on the left shows the number of violations called per inspections to make sure we're being consistent in all our different districts in Minneapolis. Thank you, Ryan. Um, now I'd like to introduce Tom Hogan, the Director of Environmental Health for the, the State Department. Thanks, Welcome. Dan, and thank you, Chairman Gordon and members of the committee uh, for the opportunity to come before you today. Uh, and I, you know, I just want to recognize, my name's Tom Hogan. I'm the Environmental Health Division Director uh, for the Minnesota Department of Health, of which the Food, Pools, and Lodging Program is one of the program areas uh, there at the Health Department uh, at the state. I do want to recognize that compliance programs are not easy to operate, uh, and not always, uh, in my experience, not always easily managed within a public health kind of organization. But I do want to applaud uh, the city staff, the program leaders, as, as well as yourself uh, on the efforts that you have done to uh, really turn this program around uh, for the city. Uh, great strides in improving uh, the food pools and lo lodging program here in Minneapolis. And as, as I've tried to communicate uh, with our local partners and even leadership at the state, as we move towards uh, working on issues around food pools and lodging in particular as really a system approach within the state, uh, it's, it's very important to have great partnership at the local level to in order to accomplish those. I think some of the things that you are able to accomplish at the local level are innovative and can help inform how the state moves forward. And I just wanna thank uh, you and again, your staff for the work that they've done. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Tom. And uh, I wanna just go over what those results are then. Um, 
First of all, uh, and I do want to point out that um, that first employee survey was uh, before the health department. Now, in the health department with our new with our commissioner, uh, I want to make sure I call that out. Um, as you can see, uh, we have a re-energized team. Um, we have some of the highest ratings on the employee engagement survey in the city. Uh, very proud of that. Um, and we also work really hard. Uh, as you can see, all of these uh, standards that we had failed or really received substandard before are now at an A. Um, every one of our uh, programs is now acceptable, which is the highest rating. And you can see our frequency there where we went from 40% being uninspected on time to only 2% for food and where we had 73% um, being inspected late. Now we're at 0% inspected late for, for lodging. Significant um, improvement. And today we, we continue to grow. You know, this industry is an amazing industry in Minneapolis. Um, we have uh, 27,000 people employed in this industry in Minneapolis. Um, it provides almost $26 million in direct sales tax revenues to the city and uh, almost $6 million in fees through license fees to the city. Um, and uh, uh, I wanted, Ryan mentioned our guiding principles and that's why I brought this box here. Because in this box, this represents number one guiding principle. And this is what you do not want to receive, it is a stool collection kit. Um, this is when we fail. We have to send out stool collection kits because we have a foodborne illness. We're trying to check what it is. Is it viral? Is it bacterial? Our number one guiding principle is always to protect public health. Number two, we always serve our businesses and our community. And we're part of a city that works. Failing an audit is not being part of a city that works. Restoring the trust of our department is. Um, just to give you an idea of some of the things we do, we review every restaurant and uh, facility that comes through plan review. Uh, we have a dedicated team now that works with restaurants on those HACCP plans that Ryan talked about. We're doing a lot of focus on education and outreach. We um, have videos in six languages on food safety. We have handouts and guides in the same six languages. We had community forums last year where we had over 800 attendees. Um, and actually just this morning we had a class in Spanish that was uh, taught completely in Spanish by two of our uh, inspectors who are native Spanish speakers. Um, and then this week, uh, tomorrow, we have a forum for our Somali business owners. That'll be all in Somali. What else is happening? Fewer citations. Uh, we went from a, we use a hammer, to let's really work with our businesses. So we are taking a lot less money from business owners, and instead, we're getting a lot better safety outcomes. And this I'm extremely proud of. If you look at the blue is where we want to be, the orange is really bad, and the yellow is unfavorable. Look at the difference between 14 and 15 in what our inspectors are finding in restaurants as far as critical violations that are associated with foodborne illness. An incredible, incredible change. Um, we got a lot going on. Green to go, as you know, we're about halfway through implementation for that. We're just implementing the inspection phase of Staple Foods this year. We're working on an emergency shelter ordinance. We'll be involved in the bring your own bag. Uh, we're really pushing hard to get our data published and open to the public so we can be more transparent. You've probably heard about ELMS and we're configuring that. The state has released a new pool code that we're adopting. Um, we still have a lot happening. Industry continues to grow, stretching our capacity to maintain our inspection frequency. Um, implementing ELMS is going to be a major change for us. Um, there's a new food code coming out next year, which is going to be pretty major. All those marking instructions Ryan talked about and our 
our um, field inspector guide, that's all going to have to change because we're going to have a whole new rule book. I might add that we as a state are still operating under the 95 code, 98 code. So now we're going to be under the 2013 code, which is a huge improvement. Um, and let's not forget the Super Bowl. Um, we did a great job with the All-Star Game um, and the Super Bowl. We're going to, um, we have a meeting to start planning that next week. It's going to take a lot of planning to make sure we have a wonderful event with few stomach aches. So, thank you. Well, thank you. And that last slide didn't even account for uh, all the, the many uh, new ordinances that uh, me and my colleagues haven't even figured out yet that we're going to be uh, bringing forward soon. Create more. Well, we can there. hardly wait. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like that attitude. Uh, I really appreciate, uh, I think it's just fantastic, the progress that you've made and the, the well it's going now. I appreciate the work that everybody has done uh, to do this. It's fantastic. Um, Councilmember Bender, did you have a comment? Or Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I would echo the comments about how incredible the progress is, and it's sort of a luxury to be able to ask this question. Um, but I interact a lot with the businesses in my ward as they open or change owners, and um, I think I've seen improvement even in my time in office. But I was interested in the peer um, inspections piece because one of the things I hear about from the businesses in my ward is this inconsistency issue. And they'd have one inspector come and say something and then another inspector come and say something else and the frustration that causes. And then I just wanted to thank all of our, so I wanted to see if you could talk about that a little bit. Um, not to sound too negative about it. I think, like I said, I've seen tons of progress even over the last couple of years. And I think, you know, our staff here, I wanted to thank you for your work because you're sort of the front line of interacting with all of these businesses that really are driving a really important part of our economy. And you're there to make sure that they're not getting people sick and keep, to keep the public safe. Um, but you're also helping support our businesses in the city and make sure our economy is growing, that our local businesses feel supported, and that's kind of a challenging balance to strike, I think, when you're there to sort of inspect and make sure everything's right, but also do it in a supportive way that makes our businesses feel welcomed and supported in the city. So I wanted to said a lot about that, but wondered if you could comment maybe on the peer inspections and anything else that we're doing um, in this front line interacting with businesses to make sure that our businesses feel welcome and supported. Uh, Mr. Chair, Council Member Bender, that's a great question, and it's something that we, we wrestle with it every day. Uh, my mom used to say, all of, our, our, all of us idios have our secrecies. And uh, there's human variation, right? What one person looks at is going to be different from what another person looks at. What I um, talk about is how do we have that variation really tight around a mean? Um, and so we have invested heavily in doing that, both through our day-to-day -day interaction, but through our system. So the peer-to-peer -peer inspections is very important for that. It does a couple things. One, it allows our inspectors to work as a team, knowing that we are in this as a team. We're not lone wolves out there on our own inspection district. And that as a team, we support each other. Um, I think that helps with morale. Um, we have uh, Kathy and Bob, who are, uh, Kathy is here, I think Bob's at the dentist, um, who will review inspection reports from every inspector every month and sit down with them to, the, to discuss the reports and talk about how we as Minneapolis are going <coughs> to call things so that we're all consistent. Um, we have the technical meeting that uh, Ryan mentioned, which is led by the senior health inspectors once a month for about an hour and a half, all the inspectors come together and discuss one or two specific code issues and how we as Minneapolis will call those. So are we perfect? No. Are we a lot better than we used to be? Yes. Are we going to get even better? I hope so. That's my goal. Thank you. One of the slides I, I liked the best was when it talked about the uh, violations per restaurant. And I think that the goal, uh, it's a sort of a shift maybe in mentality. I think that maybe years ago or maybe this was just a myth, but it seemed like um, people were rewarded and the goal was to find more violations and more violations and more violations. But really what this shows is 
everybody's kind of striving. We, what we really want is, is no violations. And I think maybe by being a little bit more proactive, a little educational, doing the kind of training and the outreach with our businesses, more and more um, people are getting there. And I think that's just fantastic. Um, and and it's, it's pretty amazing that 74% are under two or fewer. I wonder how many are at zero, but that would be um, probably a lot of them must be. Yeah, that's wonderful. Um, I don't see any other questions or comments, so we probably kept you all long enough. But feel free to stay after if you'd like. But I'm just going to move to receive and file this. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. And then our, that means our business has been concluded and this meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everybody.